All right. Well, um, how many want to hear about rainbows, blessings, and curses? Well, start off with this. Who was the greatest financier in the Bible? Who was the financial guru? I would propose it was Noah. He was floating his stock while everybody else was in liquidation. <laughs> okay. Well, all of you are aware, I would assume, of the covenant God made with Noah and his sons and all the generations that followed through his rainbow, his promise of never flooding the entire earth again. And so we're familiar with that. And so God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. We know that. We know where the rainbow, we know the story of the rainbow. My question is, is who is aware of Noah's prophetic blessing and curse? Have you heard of this? I've heard of this, but I've never understood it. <laughs> and this is not something... Uh, specific to our trip to Israel, but it is a side shoot from this by doing some of the research that uh, I was doing on our previous things with our trip to Israel, this began to pique my interest. And, um, and so uh, this is really an offshoot of what happened with our trip, but not directly related to that. But uh, <clears throat> I it, I've kind of heard of it, but I've never really looked into it. And I really, like, why? I mean, that was a prophecy 4,000, 4,500 years ago. How would it affect us today? But it does. Noah's prophecy reveals and sets a very specific pattern that is found from, generation, from Genesis all the way to Revelations and does impact our world today. See, the Word of God, the Bible, reveals the simple action to receive the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. It allows us to search His Word, though, for insights into patterns and prophecies that, that really allow us to better understand the nature of who God is and His expect expectations of those who believe in the salvation of Jesus Christ and what He provides. So, yeah, the concept is simple. Eternal life is simple. Just believe. But when you want more, there can be more. So I rejoice at your word as one who finds great spoil. And then Jeremiah tells us, our words were found and I ate them. And your words, and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. This is why I come here. Okay? I want the morsels. I want to eat God's word. I want to understand it. I want to know as much as I can about the very nature of God. I've accepted the promise. But I want more confidence. I want more of what God's word has to offer us. Well, why does God offer these morsels? He could have just said, hey, all you got to do is believe in him. Here's the story of him. Here's the gospels. Believe, and you have eternal life. Paul gives us that explanation in Acts. He says, from one man he made all the nations and they, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. So, in Genesis, the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the whole earth. Now, Noah was 500 years old when his uh, sons were born. And Shem is listed first. 
but Shem is not the firstborn. Because it says in Genesis that Shem was 102 years old after the flood, and if Noah had his first son at 500, then the firstborn was Jepheth. Because Ham is called the youngest of the brothers in Genesis 9. Now, this is math. And so, if you'll just take my word for it, or we can, you can go through the math with my wife, Tammy. She's the math expert in the family. Uh, but it is true. So, if you really look at it, the firstborn is Jepheth. Secondborn is Ham. And the third, or excuse me, is Shem. And the thirdborn is Ham. Now, this is important as it continues to establish a pattern that is throughout the entire Bible and pictures both the work of Jesus and sets the tone of God's sovereign choosing of all things for his purposes. And oftentimes these purposes are kind of curious. They're mysterious. So this is the second occurrence of a second favored son. Recall the story of Cain and Abel. Adam's second son, Abel's offering was accepted by God. Abel killed, uh, was killed uh, by his brother Cain. So Adam made love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. So Seth replaced Abel. And Seth is whom uh, God chose as the head of the line for all of God's chosen people. So, let's look back here. This is the second occurrence of a second favored order. It is Shem. He is put ahead of Jephthah, the older brother. It is Shem who was an ancestor of Jesus Christ. And this pattern will continue throughout the Bible. Now, I want to give you a couple of things that may not seem important, but we would not catch this if we did not know Hebrew. And since we don't know Hebrew, <laughs> we wouldn't catch this. But Shem's name, the name Shem, when you hear that tone, it says name or fame. That's what Shem means, a name or, or famous. Ham means passion or hot. And Jepheth means enlargement or widely extending. And those are important things to know uh, as we go through this. So, if enlarging and widely extending is Jepheth, name and equals Ham, we know this uh, is going to be important as we move forward. And a lot of times, so many names, numbers, things like that show us patterns in God's Word that that's what become the morsels. This is what becomes eaten. When we realize these things that quantify and establish God's Word in our heart and become important. So, the divine seconds. Cain was first, Abel was second, but Cain took out Abel and was replaced by Seth. Then you have the second born, uh, divine seconds. You have Jepheth, who was born first, and then you have the divine Shem, was born before Abraham, Ishmael before Isaac, Esau before Jacob. You have Leah before Rachel. You have Joseph before Benjamin. Now I'll put this in here because this is a strange occurrence because Joseph nor Benjamin are in the lineage of Christ, in the ancestry of Christ. So it's strange that God spends so much time on the story of Joseph, maybe for other reasons, but who is the lineage of the tribe? What is the tribe of Jesus is through? Remember? Judah. It's the tribe of Judah. Well, Judah was not a second born. He was the fourth born of Leah. So how does that fit in? I don't know. What we do know is that Judah did request from Joseph to be 
a servant sacrifice in the place of Benjamin when they were wanting to go back to get their father. Judah pleaded with Joseph, said, See, please keep me, do not keep Benjamin. I will be your slave, even after everybody comes back, I will be your slave. So I don't know if that has something to do with it in the fact that he substituted, wanted to substitute himself for Benjamin. And then you have Manasseh and Ephraim. Again, the second was chosen for the blessing, not the first. But they are not in the lineage. How that fits in, I'm not real sure. But God had a purpose for that. I'm just not sure what that is. And then you have Sarah and Perez. And then you have Bathsheba's first child who died. And then you have Solomon, the second. So these are just some of the biblical examples that I thought you might be aware of where the first was not the divine receiver, as we normally think that is. God chose the second. It's God's choice, not because of who is born where. But there is one other. You see, God's first man was Adam. And then he incarnated Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is the second man of God. So again, the pattern is set and the pattern is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So all of these things, names, numbers, in Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic languages that are found in the Bible, when we understand a lot of those things, it begins to give us a better image of God's nature. So, to continue. Noah is a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk, and he lay uncovered in his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. Now, this is a strange occurrence because this is the second time in the story of Noah uh, after the flood where this phrase, the father of Canaan, is put in. Ham, the father of Canaan. So, why is that important? But there is a reason. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in backward and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so that they would not see their father naked. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves, will be his, uh, he will be his brothers. The, slow, the lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. There we go. He also said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem, May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. In today's world, I've always had this thought. Why is it and how is it that professing Christians in the times of the early part of America could justify slavery. Because there were Christians, professing Christians, who lived in the South, who had slaves. Now, I would like to think that because they were Christians and had slaves, they were at least very nice to them. And there's evidence to suggest that um, because it seemed like the people who were really far out and mean and, and just treated slaves terribly were not professing Christians. But why would Christians continue to have slaves? It's this verse right here. For you see, Ham, Canaan, of course, is the son of Ham, and so it's related to Ham. Ham's descendants were basically those from Africa. So the slavery times 
I think, and I think there's some evidence to suggest this, even though it's not specifically said, but people had to justify, I'm a Christian, we're all one race, how can I have a slave? Well, slaves are throughout the, the Bible, but they're usually indentured. It's not this type of slavery that what we had in America. But it was this verse. See, these people from Africa, Ham's descendants, are called to be what? Slaves. Only problem is that word in Hebrew does not mean the word specifically slave. It means servant. But I think that's how they justified this. But if you'll look, you have Jephthah, who was, whose name is enlarged or widely extending, and you have Ham, which was passion or hot, there in Africa, uh, and close to the equator. And then you have um, Shem, whose name is fame, it means fame. Now you can see kind of the outline where those areas are that they uh, continued. But my question is, is what did Canaan do to be cursed? It doesn't tell us anything that Canaan did. But yet Noah went straight to Cain and just skipped Shem. Matter of fact, Shem's not even mentioned in this blessing and this curse. His descendants seem kind of just left out. But why Canaan? Well, it says in Numbers, he says, how can I curse those whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? See, God had blessed Ham so that he could repopulate the earth. Noah was not going to curse Ham because God had already blessed him. Canaan was not blessed. So, Noah went straight to Canaan. And if you look at that little insert there, Canaan, and that's why we hear the area where the Jews live so much, is going into the land of Canaan. Canaan's descendants stayed in that area uh, there uh, in the Middle East where Israel is today. So, this prophecy has begun to come true and did become true. So it says, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves, will be to his brothers. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Jephthah's territory. May Jephthah live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be the slave of Jeph. Now, claim, now Ham has been ignored here, but we have Jephthah, Shem, and Canaan. And Canaan's mentioned three different times as a curse, as a slave or a servant to both Shem and Jephthah. Now, in chapter 10, we see the divisions of the three sons where the table of nations are. And the curse on the Canaanites, those that followed as the sons of Canaan, will become more and more evident leading right up to the time that Israel inhabit, inhabits the promised land. And then the interaction of these people with Israel will be exactly what Noah prophesied. Who were they always fighting against? Who was always the thorn in Israel's side? Canaan, the descendants of Canaan. So after cursing, the cursing of Canaan, Noah directs his blessing to the second son, Shem. He blesses Shem first. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. Okay. So he has placed Canaan as a servant to both Shem and Japheth, and he has blessed Shem and Japheth. So the sons of Noah who came out of the ark, we're going to go back to verse 18 here, we're going backwards. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, the, <clears throat> notice this listing. It, it's listing them not in birth order. It doesn't list them in importance order, because you'd think Ham would be last here, right? The thirdborn. It lists them 
how they came out of the ark. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Not their birth order. You see, it's how they came out of the ark. The firstborn, again, Shem, is not the firstborn. Shem's descendants, as you will see in just a moment, are the first to be born again. Shem is the father of Israel. Acts chapter 2 says, is when the Holy Spirit came on to those in the upper room, right? Who were they? They were Jews. So the firstborn again that came out of the ark was Israel. Secondborn again was Ham. Okay? Ham is represented by the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 8, the next group of people that received Christ who were born again was the Ethiopian eunuch who is a descendant of Ham. The third born again, Jephthah, as he came out, is represented by Cornelius who was a Roman, a descendant of Jephthah in Acts 10. So we, re we see how the importance of that wording of Shem, Ham, and Jephthah as they came out of the salvation of the ark, it's the same order that is listed in Acts of the group of people who received the born again message of Jesus Christ. Do you see the pattern? There is neither Jew nor Gentile, Paul tells us in Galatians, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. See, in Christ, every curse is lifted, every heart is made new. All who call on him are elevated to the same level, and none rises above the other. And Paul relates this here in Galatians. All three groups found salvation in the same order as coming out of the ark. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. But they were all mentioned in that same order in Acts chapter 2. So, but there's more. There is more. Think about it. Who was the first to seek Jesus? The shepherds in Luke 2. Who were the shepherds descendants of? Shem, they were Israelites. The second to seek were the Magi from the south and from the east. They were most likely descendants of Ham. The third to seek were the Greeks. Because it says in John 12, 20, it says, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sirs, they said, we would like to see Jesus. So again, first to seek, Shem's descendants. Second to seek, Ham's descendants. Third to seek, Jephthah's descendants. And then... We can look at one other amazing biblical pattern that follows from these three sons. And it's reflected in the orders of the three synoptic gospels. See, the first gospel, Matthew, is specifically written to the Jews. It gives the lineage. It appeals to the Jewish nation. And then the second gospel, Mark, is portrayed as a servant to, to the world. That's, I mean, serving us, I forgot you, 66 times in the book of Mark. And the third gospel, Luke, Luke wrote the gospel to synoptic gospels, Jews, the servants, and then the Greeks. So, 
If you've ever wondered how the gospel of Jesus can affect people from every culture, every race, every ethnic group, it's because it's directed in various ways to the people of the world, all who came from one of the Would you agree? There is yet one other beautiful picture of the universality of this message of Jesus and his work as it is accomplished on the cross of Calvary. It is prominently displayed in the crucifixion account where each of these three branches of brothers of all mankind each took specific roles in his crucifixion. See, the sons of Shem were morally and spiritually responsible for Jesus' death. They sold him, they tried him, they convicted him, and they handed him over. As they did, they cried out, what? His blood be upon us and upon our children, the children of Shem. Ham was represented there too. Remember Simon of Serene, that northern African who acted as a servant, just as Noah had prophesied? when he carried the physical burden of the cross of Jesus, leading him to the place of the skull where he would be crucified. Simon was a descendant of Ham. And Japheth was there as well. His sons were given the executive responsibility for what occurred when Pilate tried him, and the Roman soldiers actually pierced his body through the nails and the spear. They were descendants of Japheth. Shem is the firstborn of Noah and is the chosen lineage of the nation of Israel and the Jewish Messiah and is the salvation to the world. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. Noah's prophecy has been accurately fulfilled in the line of Japheth as well. In both a literal and a spiritual sense. If you think about it, the great scientific minds and philosophical achievements of all humanity have come through Japheth as well as Shem. But if you look at the table of nations and look where people descended, look how far reaching the orange, the bluish green, the yellow, is all the descendants of Japheth. Because the sons of Japheth became coastal people of the Gentiles. And because of this, they lived around the coast, they would branch out more easily around the world. And they did so. Because of the sons of Jephthah are the predominant people of India, of Europe, and of Asia. They are therefore the source also of most American families and groups as well. So as you can see, the sons of Jephthah have what? Widely enlarged over the centuries, thus fulfilling the meaning of his name to enlarge, not only physically, but philosophically, spiritually. Look at all the things that have happened over the years. Now, a lot of this information I told you when we started came from this book from After the Flood. And uh, if, you ever, if you really want to get into the deep parts of this, um, this man Bill spent 30 plus years of doing nothing but uh, had an obsession with looking at the records in Europe and in Asia and non-biblical records of tracing lineages all the way back to the 70 names that are in chapter 10. And he was able to do that. And so it's more confirmation that the Bible is there. Now the Greeks in particular began the Western concepts of philosophy. And this is their spiritual blessing and the fact of their knowledge that they presented to all mankind. But if you think about it, you have the, uh, the Greeks, like Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, Aristotle, and then, of course, later came the Hellenistic and the Roman philosophers, and, 
you know, what all that they did. And, and then, then you had the Western medieval, the early modern, the, the modern philosophers like Martin Luther. Inventors and scientists and leaders like Newton and Galileo and George Washington and Louis Pasteur and Marie Curie and even people like Billy Graham and Bill Gates and even Steve Jobs. Look at the effect they've had on the world. And I would suspect even people like Brother Larry <laughs> and maybe even Donna. <laughs> All of these and so many more have fulfilled the blessing pronounced in Jephthah so long ago. There's one more extremely important point to make out about the sons of Jephthah. It says this, the blessing on him didn't stop with the thought of enlargement. This isn't speaking of a literal dwelling in tents. May Jephthah live in the tents of Shem. So it must be relevant to a different portion of the first part of that blessing. May, the, may Jephthah live in the tents of Shem. What does that mean? In, 19, in the 1970s, a man by the name of uh, Arthur Constance, he's a Canadian physiologist and also a Christian author, and he published this observation. Jephthah Dwelling in Shem's tents means that Jephthah will come to share in the same inheritance as Shem. Spiritual inheritance, carrying on the message of the cross of Jesus. After the Jewish people, because who were the first to share that message was the descendants of Shem. As a nation, though, they did what? They rejected Christ. And the spiritual banner that was given to Shem, that Christian message moved to what? The descendants of Jephthah. So Jephthah is now living under the blessing given to Shem by Noah. Everything from Genesis through the gospel is preparing the way of the Messiah through the sons of Shem. Then, from Acts 13, okay, from Acts 13, on the banner begins to shift to the sons of Jephthah. This isn't just a leap in, a, in my speculation because the Bible elsewhere speaks of dwelling in another's tents in the same spiritual manner. You dwell in someone's tents. But understanding the concepts derived by the sons of Jephthah, Noah's blessing upon Jephthah is amazing when we see how it has been spiritually fulfilled in this way. Who has been responsible over the last 1900 years of spreading the message of the gospel? Has it been the Jews? Has it been the descendants of Jephthah? The European corridor, even in India and America, it was fulfilled just as Noah had predicted. Everything from Genesis on through the Gospels and all the way up to Acts chapter 12 is preparing the way for the Messiah and bringing the good news first in the tent of the sons of Shem. Then from Acts 13 on, the banner begins to shift to the sons of Jephthah. This is important and it's an amazement. You see, God's word is a tasty morsel. What a joy to hear. Understand and absorb so that we experience rejoicing in our hearts, just as Jeremiah told us. But before we get too excited, let's look back at an even bigger picture real quick that Noah provides. See, Jephthah enlarged his tent, his people, his territory, his knowledge, his experience. However, Jephthah has, a, has or will be living under the benefits of Shem's covering. Noah said it. Look at how God both started and will complete his message to the world through the Jewish people. The book of Acts begins in Jerusalem, speaking to the Jews, and ends where? In Rome. And it ends with these words. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. 
For 2,000 years, the Jewish people were, excite, were <coughs> exiled from around the world and dwelt in tents of foreigners. But now, God has restored them to their homeland. And in his sovereign way, he has faithfully protected and returned his unfaithful people. And he will continue to do so as the world begins to come against the nation of Israel. In Revelation, the first three chapters deal with the church. But from chapter 4 through 19, it deals solely with the nation of Israel and the end times. And finally, in chapter 19, Christ returns to Israel and the church. And the book finishes off with the three chapters of future events which combine the physical and the spiritual, and we see the final merging of God's people from both Jews and Gentile. The message of redemption found in the person of Jesus Christ, the greatest of all the descendants of Shem, and our Lord and Savior. God is renowned in Judah. In Israel, his name is great. His tent is in Salem, his dwelling place in Zion. And now you hopefully have a better understanding of the prophecy of Noah.